let's start and um, I will uh, I will um, um, present actually your biography for uh, those who are not very familiar with your research. Um, Which should be everybody, I hope. Yes. <laughs> uh, welcome to our lecture series, Levant Cradle of Abrahamic Religion, devoted to some cases, exemplary cases of religious culture in Mediterranean area and Middle East, viewed through the lenses of academic experts and presented more or less for a general audience. We explore religion and society at the intersection of the Middle East, Northern Africa, the Balkans, and the Caucasus. Each of these re regions shaped their distinct cultural profiles under the influence of numerous currents stemming from the biblical Levant in the distant past and which coexisted under successive imperial authorities. Our today's speaker is Professor Stephen Fine from, from Eshiva University in New York. Stephen Fine is Dean Pinkos Charging Professor of Jewish History and Director of the Yeshiva University Center for Israel Studies. He is a cultural historian specializing in Jewish history in the Greek or Roman period. Fine's work focuses mainly upon the literature, art, and archaeology of ancient Judaism under the ways that modern scholars have interpreted Jewish antiquity. His explorations of history, rabbinic literature, archaeology, and art, together with deep engagement with historiography and contemporary culture, is expressed in a broad range of publications. Those include academic monographs and more than 80 articles where he engaged the history of Judaism with a sympathetic yet critical eye. Stephen Fine's recent volume, The Menorah from the Bible to Modern Israel, Harvard University Press, 2016, attempts to bring those audiences together from scholars to clergy, graduate students to high school readers. Another book of Fine, Art and Judaism in the Greco-Roman World Toward the New Jewish Archaeology, received the 2009 Jordan Schnitzel Book Award of the Association for Jewish Studies. Stephen is also editor of Images, a journal for the study of Jewish art and visual culture and editor of the history of Jewish religious architecture. Fine is also <clears throat> his uh, 1999 edited volume, Jews, Christian and Politeis, Culture and Inter Interaction during the Greco-Roman period, published by Routledge, was the finalist for the Charles Revson Foundation Award in Jewish Christian Relations of the National Jewish Book Council. His next book, The Arch of Titus, From Jerusalem to Rome and Back, is right now in press. Stephen's fine lecture to both popular and academic audiences throughout the United States, Europe, Israel, <coughs> and both English and Hebrew. His work has been featured in in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Los Angeles Times, Biblical Archaeology Review, Haaret, and numerous other new sources. As you see in his work, his work is impressive, which makes us to listen with a great interest uh, his lecture today entitled Samaritan and Jews in Late Antique Palestine, Rabbinic Perspective. Dear Professor Fine, thank you for accepting our invitation. Now the floor is yours. I'm happy to be with you in, in Bucharest, if, if even from a distance. Um, I look forward to meeting you both electronically and uh, once this plague has ended in person as well. So thank you for inviting me. That's number one. Let me put on some slides and we can um, discuss some objects and some text, and then we'll have plenty of time for conversation, okay? So I am now going to share my screen. Good. Today we're going to speak about Samaritans and Jews in late antique Palestine, meaning from the late Roman period through the rise of Islam, that period that we refer to often as the age of transition. Uh, and we're going to deal with a specific body of literature, mostly the writings of the ancient rabbis that uh, influential 
group of literati who in our case functioned um, both in the southern coastal plain. Uh, if you land at Lod Airport at uh, Ben Gurion, you are in uh, prime rabbinic territory of the th second and third centuries. And the, and the lower Galilee region up through um, the Sea of Galilee. So we're dealing with a particular intellectual group that has of course been central to the history of Judaism and how it looks at another group, the Samaritans, which is our next point. But before we go on, next slide. Come on, do so, there we go. Um, since, we're in, since we're in Romania, um, I could not pass without uh, dedicating this talk to the memory of the late great Moses Gaster, um, the Romanian scholar who was so influential to the study of uh, Romanian folklore and even more influential in the study of Jewish folklore and in the creation of Samaritan studies. And so um, in coming back to Romania, I think he'd be very happy with me. Yes, yes. Now, the Samaritans, if you read your Bible, say in 2 Kings 17, you will find out that in 722 BCE with the destruction of the Northern Kingdom of Israel, uh, the Samaritans, the, the Assyrians did their, their usual and brought a group of um, foreigners from another country, in this case, a place called Kuta in um, Mesopotamia, and settled them in Samaria. They married with the locals, because they created their own priesthood. They, because they angered the local God, meaning the God of Israel, went through some sort of conversion because they were chased by lions and finally um, turned into adversaries to the larger or the self-important Judean community. Stephen, now, uh, sorry. To describe the origins of the Samaritans. Samaritans mm. have a very different story. Their story is, of course, that they are the descendants of the northern tribes of Israel. Now, with the return of the tribes, the uh, Judean captives, after the destruction of the temple in 586 BCE in Jerusalem, mm. um, the returnees under Ezra and Nehemiah began the process of, of rebuilding. And apparently some folks from the north, people from the area of Samaria, asked to help in the rebuilding of the temple. When they were rebuffed, they wrote to the, the authorities in Persia to complain about how the Judeans were trying to create a temple and build their city, which would clearly be to the detriment of the Persian Empire. Verse 23. Then, when a copy of King Xerxes' letter back to them was read before Rahum and Shimshai, the scribe and their associates, they went in haste to the Jews at Jerusalem by force and power and made them cease. Then the work of the house of God, which is in Jerusalem, stopped, and it ceased until the second year of the reign of Darius, king of Persia. Now, Jewish history and relationship with the Samaritans starts here, with Samaritans forcing the cessation of the building, the rebuilding of the temple in Jerusalem. We're going to begin here as well. But before we do, let's talk about who these Samaritan people were. You see before you an early 20th century postcard of the high priest of the Samaritans. At that point, about 140 souls in Nablus, in Shechem. The high priest, Jacob, son of Aaron, was an amazing publicist, had relations across the board with Jews and Christians, among his closest relationships being with uh, Moses Castor. Now he's standing beside a Torah scroll from the Middle Ages, which Samaritans truly believe is, was written by a, the nephew of Moses, a fellow named Abisha at the gate of the tabernacle. 
the biblical tabernacle, as it rested on Mount Grizim after it was brought into the Holy Land. Okay? Now, for Samaritans, this Torah scroll is their, um, their point of, of uh, authenticity. From this scroll, this is their Moses received Torah from Sinai and gave it to the priest on Mount Grizim statement. All right, so here we see the high priest. Everyone can see it, I hope. There you see the Abisha scroll, their most prized possession. Um, but what's important about the scroll, of course, is that while it is a Torah scroll we now know with a text that is uh, very similar to those uh, created in a hybrid sense by the, um, in the Hasmonean period, solving many of the literary problems of, uh, of the Torah. So for example, where um, one version of the Ten Commandments says remember and the other says observe, this says in both places observe. And so there's a Torah scroll similar to those used by Jews, the difference being that um, it mentions Mount Grizim as the Tenth Commandment, one must sacrifice on the Holy Mountain, which for Jews we are going to see is fight and talk. Here you see the same scroll today in the Samaritan synagogue with my friend Najah Cohen holding it up. Um, the Abisha scroll, the most important artifact in Samaritan life. It's another scroll. What's important about the Samaritan Torah and Samaritan culture is that it functions with a different Hebrew script. It functions with the, what we call the Paleo-Hebrew script. They uh, differentiated somewhere in the third century or so from Jews. Jews stopped using this script. Samaritans started using this or continued using this script. Um, you'll remember that coming back from Babylonia, Jewish tradition has it, that um, the Torah scroll was intentionally written in high imperial script, uh, Aramaic script, rather than this ancient Canaanite script, if you will. Um, which, um, and so this is another point of difference between Jews and Samaritans. Now, you hear you see the same Najah Cohen uh, during one of the Samaritan pilgrimage days on top of Mount Grizim, the holy mountain of the Samaritans above uh, Nablus. Pilgrimage on Mount Grizim. Remember, Mount Grizim is the mountain that God has chosen. Mount Grizim is the uh, place where Noah's Ark landed. It's the place where the tabernacle was placed. It's the place where the binding of Isaac took place. It's the place where the tabernacle was hidden. And in the future, when the Tahab, the returner comes, who's some sort of incarnation of Moses, will be redeemed because it was hidden on the mountain. That's Samaritan theology. Okay, so it's pilgrimage on one of the festivals. And here you see excavations on Mount Grizim, conducted in the 1980s by uh, Yitzhak Magen. Uh, in the center up above is the uh, Church of the Teotokos, the church, the church of, uh, of the Mother of Christ, um, that was uh, built, you know, by, in, in the time of uh, what well, was expanded in the time of Justinian. Um, but on the sides, you can see the vast infrastructure of the Samaritan temple city that existed here beginning during the Persian period and continuing all the way through the Hellenistic period until 114 BCE, when John Hyrcanus came north from Judea and destroyed this space. Now, the Samaritans do not recognize today having had a temple on Mount Grizim, but they do know that they had a sacrificial installation. And so they would call this a, sac a sacrificial compound rather than a, a temple. But whatever language you use, it's a place where Samaritans did sacrifices and had a whole, whole instrumentality destroyed by the Hasmoneans, which did not create happiness between these two groups, right? It's a moment when Jews and Samaritans in the end clashed. And so what we've seen is a group of people who live in the north, whose holy mountain is Mount Grizim, whose Torah is different from the Jewish Torah, that have traditions, calendar, different from Jews who descend from the, who claim to descend and probably descend from the northern tribes of Israel, and not meaning the Josephite tribes, 
rather than from Judea. They are not Jews. And as you might say today, they are not Jews and they are not Palestinians, but they are both and they are neither. All of that to bring us, of course, to the famous Passover sacrifice, which believe it or not, in Jewish tradition, wouldn't be an impossibility to do even on the Temple Mount today, medieval rabbis sometimes came to Jerusalem and did a Paschal sacrifice. Um, the famous Samaritan Paschal sacrifice, of course, is center. You notice the, um, the um, seating in the back for tourists. Lots of people go, and I hope some of you have or will soon. Now, in late antiquity, Samaritans were, of course, centered in um, central Samaria. You see Mount Grisim below it, Neapolis, the city found, uh, founded by Herod and then Vespasian uh, as a pagan city, the new city, Neapolis, uh, and a marker for two Samaritan synagogues that have been discovered um, in the last 50 years at El Cherbe and at Cherbet Samara. Um, during this period, Samaritans spread during late antiquity, beginning with the uh, the first and late first, the early second century BCE, Samaritan population spread, particularly into the coastal plain, uh, down to Shalavim, to Jaffa, um, to, up, up to Caesarea, but also to the north of Samaria, to the area of Beit Shan. Okay, so we have a growing Samaritan presence, and we have lots of archaeological evidence today for this presence. And so the synagogue at El Cherva, which is just outside of uh, Nablus, um, with, which is um, aligned or oriented toward Mount Grisim. We don't know exactly what went on in Samaritan synagogues. We have a lot of their prayer, but we don't have liturgical instructions from that period. But we are dealing in the fourth, fifth century when this was built with a expanding Samaritan community um, and, and a, a intellectually expanding Samaritan community. They have a lot of literature coming out. Here's the interior of the synagogue reconstructed, and just for fun, this wonderful mosaic that was discovered there. Now, this is a lot like Jewish mosaics, but of course, I just lost it, I'm sorry. Yeah, okay, we'll go here. Now, the Samaritans spread into the coastal plain, we also have archeological evidence of. And so from Apollonia, um, Crusader Arshuf, Near Herzliya, we have this wonderful mosaic on the left, which is pretty good, except we can't read the Samaritan at all. It makes no sense. It's gibberish, but we'll leave that. Um, to the right from Amaios, famous city from both rabbinic and New Testament literature, at the gateway to Jerusalem, this wonderful capital uh, with a Samaritan script that says, Uvaruch uh, Shmo Le'olam, may his name be blessed eternally, or in Greek, Esteos, which was a term used specifically by Samaritans and Greeks, and really very seldom by Jews. Again, in the coastal plain at Shalaviv, which is just slightly to the um, west of Amaios, this wonderful mosaic that refers to the synagogues as Ukterion, has Greek and um, Hebrew inscriptions. Remember that while Jews, Christians, and um, Samaritans could probably make out what these words mean, especially if they were in Aramaic, these are in Hebrew, they all spoke the same Aramaic. Jews and Samaritans used the same Hebrew, but only Samaritans could read the script. And so it's a real internal conversation. And to the right, uh, on the grounds of the uh, Eretz Israel Museum in North Tel Aviv, another Samaritan inscription with another, again, Samaritan script, which we'll come back to in, in just a minute. Lastly, in Beit Sha'an, this wonderful synagogue mosaic, but, uh, but I'd like to point out um, down below on the left, the synagogue mosaic from the synagogue at the uh, hot springs of Tiberias, Hamat Tiberia, where you'll see on either side of each menorah, an incense shovel, a ram's horn, a shofar, and a lulav bunch, a palm frond. If you look at the Samaritan floor, you'll find the incense shovel and you'll find the horn, but there is no palm frond and citron, no lulav and etrog. Um, the reason being that Samaritans um, did not interpret the biblical verses that led to the Jewish lulav and etrog in the same way 
and don't use that vessel. Now, this looks, this floor, this Jewish floor and this Samaritan floor look mostly alike. In fact, the Samaritan floor was built by the same artisans who built another synagogue floor at Beit Alpha. But there's the subtle difference. And it's often the subtle differences that create hostility, which is where we're going to end up in a little while. Okay, here we are. Going back to an Ezra and Nehemiah, a book of that period of transition, the Perketa Rabbi Eliezer, the chapters of Rabbi Eliezer, which dates to the eighth or ninth century, describes how rabbis sent emissaries in the time of 2 Kings 17 to Samaria to properly convert those Samarians. But those Samaritans acted out and broke away from rabbinic authority. And when the Jews wanted to build their temple, got in the way and even made war against them and came on Jerusalem to destroy it. Now, that builds on the text in Ezra 4 that we saw. But let's see where this text goes further. They, Ezra and Nehemiah and others, brought 300 priests and 300 children and 300 shofars, uh, ram's horns, with 300 Torah scrolls in their hands, and they sounded the horns. The Levites melodized and sang and excluded the Kutim with the secret of the ineffable name. Let's start on Kutim. The people who came from Kuta were called by Jewish tradition of the late Second Temple period and onward, Kutim, meaning those people from Kuta who aren't really Israelites, but are fake converts. Now, when my son was in um, elementary school in the fourth grade, they were studying the Tractate of Rosh Hashanah that mentions the Kutim doing nefarious things that we'll see in a moment. And the teacher was talking about the Kutim and all the bad things they did. Like this, for example. And my then fourth grader looked up at the, the teacher and said, Rabbi so-and-so, you shouldn't call Samaritans Kutim. He said, why, why, Alicia? He said, and then he looked at him, because it's a terrible slur and in American jargon, the N-word, right? It's calling someone a horrible, horrible thing. And you just shouldn't do that. Well, the next day, the rabbi came to me and told me the story and said, Professor Fine, who are these Kutim? In other words, when Jews referred to Samaritans as Kutim, it was not a compliment. They are foreigners. At very least, they are rebels. And excluded the Kutim with the secret of the ineffable name, the Tetragrammaton both in writing and on tablets, including excommunication of the heavenly court and excommunication of the earthly high court, decreeing that no person of Israel may eat kuti bread ever. Now, after all this, with the horns, with the Levites, with the children, with the writing, with the court, the worst they can come up with is, by the way, don't buy their bread. We're going to come back to that because this text is a wonderful patiche of other texts that will uh, are far more complex than it is. From here, they said, whoever eats kuti bread is as if he ate pig meat, which for Jews and Samaritans, of course, is a bad thing. You may not convert a kuti, and they have no part in the resurrection of the dead. Now, this text is rather final in claiming the ultimate separation between Jews and Samaritans and projects it um, 1500 years earlier to the time of Ezra and Nehemiah. Now, that being said, this complex text isn't the last word. And throughout Jewish history, Samaritans and Jews have been side by side as the two Israelites nations, sometimes liking each other, usually not, always curious. And so what we're dealing with is a uh, relationship, a 
conflict, a complexity, probably the oldest in Western culture, going back to the tribes of Judah and Israel and continuing into the 20th century when this problem was finally resolved. Now, Josephus, that great Jewish historian, describes those nefarious Samaritans in the first century. Some Samaritans, he wrote, who had secretly entered Jerusalem began to scatter bones, this is in the early first century, in the porticos of the temple and throughout. At the at the, as a result, the priest, although they had previously observed no such custom, excluded everyone from the temple in addition to taking other measures for the greater protection of the temple. In other words, if you're gonna spread bones, you're making the temple defiled, you cannot use it, right? And so those nefarious Samaritans, or similarly in the Mishnah in Tratate Rosh Hashanah, in former times, they would light signal fires lifted on staves to signal from the top of one mountain to the next to the great diaspora in Babylonia, sending, um, sending signal fires, telling what, what day and what time the new moon would fall, specifically just before the uh, Rosh Hashanah, the Jewish New Year, so that everyone would keep the same calendar. Well, apparently, as the signal fires went up the Jordan Rift Valley, past Samaria, there were Samaritans who, there were Kutim, who corrupted this. In other words, they added other flames to screw up the system. They decreed, the rabbis decreed that they should send out messengers. So we're dealing with a relationship that is so intensely unpleasant that the, the gospel according to Luke could be surprised that there's any such thing as a good Samaritan or as most Jews would probably have told you in the first century, reading that story or hearing that story, um, there was only one. Now, that statement from the Mishnah from Tractate Shvi'it is set in the name of Rabbi Eliezer ben Herkonos, who functioned at the end of the second temple period and was known for his biting tongue. And this is what he said. He that eats bread of the Samaritans is like one that eats pig's flesh. You can always tell when rabbis uh, engage in hyperbole of some, this source that there are actually Jews eating Samaritan bread. And the only way he could think seemingly control that in the years after the destruction of the temple was by comparing it to pig's flesh. Well, his teacher, Rabbi Akiva, looked at his own students and said, shh. I'm not gonna tell you about this. In other words, Rabbi Akiva stifles the older Rabbi Eliezer's comments such that the world is far more complex. And by the way, down below is some bread from you know, Herculaneum or Pompeii just for fun. The Tosefta, another early rabbinic text, describes Passover matzot, unleavened bread, and makes the generalized statement that the unleavened bread of the kutim is permitted, and a person may fulfill his obligation of eating unleavened bread with it on Passover. In other words, you don't need Israeli matzah, you don't need American matzah, it doesn't have to come in that sealed box, right? Um, you could buy what Samaritan matzah, which looks a lot like pita, which looks a lot like Syrian Jewish matzah, um, and, and use it on Passover, according to this text. Of course, it's a 19th century, early 20th century, Samaritan baking his matzah, on Mount Grizim. Rabbi Eliezer, excuse me, Rabbi Elazar, the student of Rabbi Kiva, said as follows. He prohibited it just because he doesn't think that they're very careful in following the laws. In other words, it's not that they do it wrong. It's that it's not that there's anything wrong with it. It's that it's just not good enough, according to Rabbi Elazar. In other words, he's uncomfortable, but he can't figure out how to say it. But Rabbi Shimon ben Gamliel, around 150, the patriarch, goes further. Any commandment that the Samaritans have taken hold of, they are much more meticulous at it than Jews are. Now, he calls Jews Israel and leaves Samaritans out of that designation, which is standard. After all, we're Israel, you're not Israel. But what's most important here is even as that's the case, he is saying that Samaritans, well, they're not so foreign. If they are doing one of the 613 commandments of the Torah, they do it well, which is an astonishing thing to say and a great liminal complexity. Now, 
the Jerusalem Talmud around 400 has a different statement. It takes Rabbi Shimon ben Gamliel's comment that whatever the Samaritans do well, they do well. But then it comes up with its own statement that changes the game radically. And it has one Rabbi Shimon say, that was originally true. In the mid first century, uh, second century, that was true. But by our time, this is the deal. What was true originally when they were still dwelling in their villages, but now that they have, uh, that they have not even a single commandment or remnant of a commandment, they are suspect and they are corrupted. Oh, well, when they lived up in Samaria, they were okay, right? But now that they've come into the urbanized section of the coastal plain, we don't trust them at all. In other words, the spreading Samaritan menace of a large and growing community is creating an imbalance by the fourth century, by the third, fourth century, late third, fourth century. Now, I point out that in the synagogue that was discovered, the Samaritan synagogue that was discovered at uh, Apollonia, the Greek is perfectly good Greek. Asteos, one God, save this one and this one. That's great. Um, but the Samaritan script is absolutely incomprehensible and poorly written. Similarly, at Ramad Aviv, we have a Samaritan script, but we have a Greek inscription. And in Greek, we have two perfectly good Greek names. And so we, here we see Samaritans, in both cases, donating to Samaritan synagogues who are ignoramuses. They cannot do Samaritan. They will use Samaritan as a symbol. It would be like me writing my English name in Hebrew script, right? It's ignorance, especially in the dedication in a synagogue. So this is slight evidence of Samaritans, in fact, um, becoming less traditionally observant. But I can tell you that Jews were doing similar things. We have inscription, an inscription from near um, Gaza, for example, which you can tell that whoever did it did not know Hebrew too well. And so, and, and we know that in Caesarea Maritima, they allowed people to say Shema, the central Jewish prayer in Greek, because they didn't know any Hebrew at all. So we're dealing with that westernized acculturation, whether this text in the Talmud is relating to that or not, I don't know. But what I can tell you is that by the late, the mid third century, early fourth century, we have Rabbi Abahu, the student of the great Rabbi Yochanan, and the, and the group of rabbis mostly functioning in Tiberias, coming down on the on Samaritanism, coming down on the relationship between Jews and Samaritans. Now, even as they are becoming negative, let me just point out that they're becoming negative toward Jews that don't follow Judaism as strictly as they do. These academics are asserting their authority, and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. Rabbi Abahu forbade their wine. Why did he forbid Samaritan wine? Remember, wine is, as we all know, a, uh, a sacramental liquid. It's not just grape juice, or it's not just apple juice. Wine um, is symbolic of, trend, of, of religious experience, and Jews maintain their own wine from everyone else at that period. They were going to Har Hamela, meaning the uh, Judea, and saw a Kuti who was suspect regarding their wine. In other words, was drinking non-Jewish wine or non-Samaritan wine, non-Jewish wine. They came, up, uh, they came and they reported him to Rabbi Abahu. He said to them, can we not forbid the uh, Samaritan wine for this reason alone? So they find one Samaritan drinking non-kosher wine and they, they, they're looking for a reason to forbid them, to, to distance from this community. There is, are some who would say, on one Sabbath, no, one, no wine was found in all of Samaria. At the end of the Sabbath, it, it was full of wine that the non-Jews had brought and the Samaritans had accepted from them. In other words, they are looking for reasons to prove that Samaritans drink non-kosher wine and hence cannot be trusted. Down below is a servant carrying amphorae. Let's keep going. Our text continues. There are some who would say when Diocletian, meaning the emperor, the king came here, 
to Caesarea or to Palestine in general. He came twice in 286 and then in 297, eight, he decreed and said that all the nations must pour out libations to the emperor, except for the Jews. Jews had throughout the history of a relationship with the Romans, except during the Flavian period, the right to not participate in the imperial cult. In the third century, Samaritans were excluded from that proposition, okay? Therefore, the Samaritans poured out libations. Thus, their wine was considered forbidden in idolatrous worship. Now, let me just respond to that. If the Samaritans had not poured out the wine, they would have been killed as traitors because they had no right, like that of the Jews, to not participate in the imperial cult. Think of the implications. Samaritans had no right to not participate. Now, this is a pretty stringent way of dealing with these people. Let's go one more. There are some who would say they have a kind of dove and they pour out libations to it. Now, anybody who's been to the uh, Nablus or seen the images will know that Mount Grisim is a very tall mountain. Remember, so is Sepphoris, for example, Sipori, which is called Sipori because it looks like there could be a bird's nest on top. I think a similar kind of statement is being made about Mount Grisim because Samaritans also remember Christians placing a great big dove on top of the mountain. Now, where would rabbis get the idea that Samaritans are praying to a dove? Well, if you look at this coin that was Mount, uh, issued in Neapolis in the third century, you will see up, um, on either side of the goddess in the center, Atagatas, you will see a cage and in the cage is a birdie. Now, if you saw that coin, you might think that those people in Nablus are praying to birds. Now I point out this is a pagan coin and not a Samaritan coin. Not only that, there are coins like this minted everywhere in many other places. So for example, at Damascus, there's a similar coin. This isn't a particularly Samaritan object. So maybe rabbis came up with this idea that Samaritans were praying to a dove set on top of Mount Scopus, both because of the, about Mount, Mount Gerizim, both because of the um, geography and because of coins like this. Well, by that time, at least rabbis and their followers are not buying Samaritan wine anymore. Samaria is very close to Caesarea Maritima. And so this is a huge economic loss for the Samaritans uh, in the region and the middlemen who lived in the city. The Samaritans of Caesarea asked Rabbi Abahu, who began this conversation, your fathers would make use of our wine. Why don't you use our wine? He said to them, your fathers did not corrupt their deeds. You have corrupted your deeds. And so they've set up a model that there was a window when Samaritans and Jews got along. And in the fourth century, they're closing it. Now, remember though, that they're also closing it on Jews whose practice they don't like either, whom they call Amea Aris. okay? Now, another story from the same block. Rabbi Yishmael, son of Rabbi Yossi went to Neapolis, right? Nothing say Shem. It said, doesn't say uh, Shechem, it says Theopolis using the Greek name. Kutim came up to him. Oh, they noticed him. There are lots of disputations represented in rabbinic literature between um, rabbis and, and Kutim. He looked at them and said, I see that you do not prostrate yourselves before the mountain. And the mountain of course is down below on the right. Rather, you bow to the idols that Jacob, our father, buried beneath it, in the time of Rachel's idols, the um, for it is written, and Jacob hid them under the oak, which is near Shechem. This is an old idolatry. The students of Rabbi Abahu are looking for reasons to declare Samaritans idolaters. I do point out that in the third century, Mount Grisim had a great big pagan temple on top. So you can see how this would be a uh, malleable conversation. But this isn't all rabbis had to say, the negative. We're going to look at a story preserved in a book called Leviticus Rabbah. It's about fourth, fifth century, same as all the others, a little bit later than the Jerusalem Talmud. 
And the story is put in the name of Rabbi Simon, Rabbi Shimon, son of Yochai. And the story, which is part of a homily, begins with a uh, general statement. The Israelites are prominent because they know how to please their creator. Oh, great. Israelites are successful. They're prominent because they know how to keep God happy. And it gives examples. The other examples are sharecroppers and people who do not tithe properly. The first example of an Israelite, and that's the important statement, however, is those Kutim, who we haven't seen included in Israel before. And our story goes on like the Kutai. The Kutai are clever in business. One of them went to a woman. He said to her, do you have an onion? Give it to me. So you can imagine a Samaritan peddler going to the door of a Jewish home, maybe somewhere near Samaria or not, possibly in Caesarea, possibly in Beit Sha'an, right? And going up to a woman's door. Now, peddlers, especially minority peddlers, are often ascribed with being clever in business. I know, because in Eastern Europe, that's how they talked about my relatives, right? In other words, Jews refer to Kutim who are in their environment, not as people to be cursed, not as people who've been excommunicated, people who are liminal, who are related, who are Israelites, who they talk to. And so this Kuti comes to the door, knock, 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 and God talks to the woman of the house, and up above is a house in Katsurin that I helped build uh, in the Golan Heights, and talks to the woman in the house and says to her, do you have an onion? And she says, sure, give it. And he says, give it to me. Then she brought it to him. And he said to her, what's an onion without bread? So she went in the house, got a piece of bread. And when she brought it to him, he said to her, gee, that's great. What's a meal without a drink? And then, of course, she brought the drink. And out of that, he ate and drank. Now, there's no negativity in this folktale. There's relationship in this folktale. This is an academics discussing. This is the Samaritan peddler coming to the door. This is real life as opposed to academic life. Who knows how many people listen to Rabbi Abahu and the question of wine or not. But I can tell you that Jews and Samaritans had synagogues that looked much alike, almost exactly, right? They had scripture that was much alike. But what didn't they have that was much alike? Mount Grizim and their Torah and the sense of being the Josephite tribes with their own high priesthood and a sense of grievance against the Judeans for having destroyed their sacrificial compound. Well, by the time you get to the eighth or ninth century, the Perkader Rebbe Eliezer text has come together. It's taken the rather benign statement of Rabbi Eliezer, taken away the author's name, turned it into a general statement. That's the same statement that Rabbi Akiva said, eh, that's too strict, leave me alone. And that rabbis for, just, for uh, generations after that had to deal with, had to think about. The same text, but by the 8th and ninth century, it becomes the taunt. It's the only text they got to say that you can't deal with Samaritans on a daily basis. In other words, if the Jewish peddler had gone to the Samaritan lady's house, right? They're telling him not to eat her, don't, don't take a piece of bread from her, right? Because it's like pig meat. This is a text intended to keep Jews and Samaritans apart. And in the Islamic period makes even more sense because Jews were definitely Dimi, they were definitely peoples of the book and protected, and Samaritans were not clear whether they were going to be protected and whether they were going to be killed and whether they were going to be persecuted, a process that began in the time of John Hyrcanus, continued with the Romans, continued with the Christians, continued with the Muslims, 
uh, un literally until a group of uh, Amer American British Protestants and then more fully the state of Israel came in uh, to, their, to their defense and literally to feed them. Now, Samaritans were not sitting idly by letting Jews tell stories. Not at all. In fact, the, the great Samaritan liturgic, uh, Agadic text, the great legendary collection, the, the chronicle of Abu al-Fath tells our story in Ezra and Nehemiah, but about the nefarious Judeans, not the nefarious Samaritans. In other words, it's literally created a counter history of the Jewish story and says as follows. You know, when Ezra did this, those Judeans broke away. They started their own script. They falsified the Torah. And he goes on. Consequently, bad feelings worsened between Samaritans and Jews and their mutual loathing intensified. Ain't that the truth? That's exactly what happened. And what I've tried to do in the last little while is give you a sense of how at least from Jewish literature, using archaeological texts as a, uh, objects as a touchstone, we can see the complexities of relationship between Jews and Samaritans in late antiquity. But remember, in the end, Jews and Samaritans, the two Israelite peoples, the two Sabbath keeping people, the two circumcising peoples, were the majority population. And as much as they might have find, found each other difficult or not, Compared to the pagan and then Christian colonizing imperialist forces who were the minority, they had much more in common than they had separating them, which continued all the way through the Middle Ages. Finally, a book called Masechet Kutim, a uh, rabbinic text of the same period, more or less, as the Perkei Rebbe Eliezer, goes through and discusses wh what what's the status of Samaritans? And it talks about, about how you should behave toward them in this liminal state between being Jews and non-Jews. And it ends up as follows. And when in the great future do we accept them as Jews? And it goes on and says, when they give up their belief in Mount Gerizim, accept Jerusalem and believe in the resurrection of the dead. From that, point on a Samaritan is like a Jew. Now, two different visions in the late antique reality. Now, what I just described to you as a part of the Yeshiva University Israelite Samaritans project, which includes an exhibition that will open at the Museum of the Bible in Washington in fall 22, a cookbook, a scholarly volume called The Samaritans of Biblical People, which I edit, the talk that I just gave is based upon an article that I wrote together with um, Shana Shik, um, of, uh, who is a fellow at the Yeshiva University Center for Israel Studies, um, and a wonderful documentary um, now called Ha'eda, The People by Moshe Alafi, which will open next year as well. And so the YU Israelite Samaritan Project. With that, I, I wanna thank you all for um, inviting me. And I'm open for discussion. And I'm going to put my face back so you can see me. OK? Um, thank you very much for this impressive lecture. Uh, it was a very rich presentation from which we have learned a lot. Now we start a very short session of question and answers. Uh, if there are some questions from the participants, maybe from Doru. Hello, Doru. Um, hello. Uh, 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 thank you very much for the lecture, uh, and thank you, Catalin. Thank you for the organizing, uh, for, for the organization. Uh, I'm a bit surprised uh, uh, you named me first, but uh, of, of course I have a couple of uh, questions. Um, <clears throat> I wouldn't have, uh, I wouldn't have uh, started uh, as the first, um, but uh, th thank you. Um, um, so, so um, again, thank you, uh, Steve, very much for, uh, for for the topic, uh, which is uh, 
fascinating one, actually. Uh, we have these groups, uh, Jews and uh, Samaritans and Christians, uh, um, um, fighting with each other, actually, uh, for the name of Israel, I would say. So, uh, th there are many groups uh, uh, starting to or reclaiming the name for uh, reclaiming the name for themselves. Um, the difference being, of course, that Christians are Israel of the, of the spirit. Uh, of and course, the Jews and the Samaritans are Israel of the faith of the of, uh, of, the, of the of the body, right? Of course, of course, of course. Um, would you say that uh, the Samaritans are uh, uh, practicing or are showing a kind of Sadducean religiosity, uh, a kind of priestly really a religiosity more than the Jews? Um, um, th there are many questions, of course, uh, concerning the topic. Uh, I don't know what to ask first. Um, you, you, Should I do that one first? <laughs> of course. Cool. All right. Now, look, um, it has been hard for people to treat the Samaritans seriously. Um, recent archaeological excavation, whether on Mount Grisim, which takes us back to the Persian period, or the Wadi Dalia text, or even the Elephantine text, Elephantine text uh, show us that there's stuff going on in the north with those same people described in Ezra and Nehemiah, right? Sanballat and his family. Um, that's real. And that they don't, and that they claim to be the northern tribes and that they're treated like they're the northern tribes, right? Mm -hmm. And so this idea that people have developed uh, in, in, in mostly in America, but also in Europe of uh, Samaritan Judaism is a misnomer. Mm -hmm because Samaritans live in Samaria and Jews live in Judea, right? And Judaism is one of those modern terms that people make up to describe the traditions of the Jewish people, right? Mm -hmm. And so it, it confuses. Having, um, Jews naturally um, looked to their historic heretics especially in later halakhic texts when they did not, when they knew nothing about Samaritans, right? Mm -hmm. And said, oh, they're like, Sam they're like Sadducees. They're like Baitusim. They're like, right? They're like that side of the world. Um, and, and they are in some ways, except they have a different mountain and, right? Mm -hmm. And they're, and they are more literal in their reading of texts than rabbis are. Mm -hmm. So in that way, they're, they're in that camp, right? Mm -hmm. But if you told them they were like Sadducees, they would look at you like you were out of your mind. It's sort of like, let me think, let me think. It's like the, the Catholic Orthodox tell them they're not Orthodox, you know? It's the, 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 it, the, the, the distinctions are what make the reality. And so we can look back and say, yeah, you can classify some of the Samaritan things there. But once you've got Mount Grisim in a different Torah text, you're dealing with um, sep separate theological paths, but they converge and go in and out. And so Samaritans use Sadia Gaon's translation of the Torah into Arabic. And they took the 613 number of mitzvot from Jewish books and they took Jewish, um, they took the Bible and read it backwards and turned it into a counter history when they needed to write a history to, com to, com to convince the Muslims that they really are ancient Israelites. So their chronicle tradition convinces themselves and the Muslims. Let's get real. You don't, if you're not Dimi, you get killed, right? Which is what happened to them over and over and over again. And so they developed a rich literature and they were smart enough to read the Jewish book and then read it backwards through their own eyes. The, uh, remember that we have rich Samaritan liturgy, huge stuff from, and, and, and Midrashic text from the fourth, fifth century. And I can tell you that when I started reading it, um, there were half a dozen of us in the world who had read these wonderful editions created by Ben, ben Chaim. They just weren't read, they weren't paid attention to. Um, I've been screaming Samaritan, Samaritan, Samaritans because it's not a twosome in late antique Palestine, it's a threesome. In other words, the ways that never parted, you want ways that never parted? It ain't Christianity. It's Samaritans and Jews because they've been intertwined forever. They're the, these two Israels of the flesh. And that's why Jews called Samaritans prayers of doves 
And that's why Samaritans call Jerusalem Arur Shalem, the hated city of Shalem, right? In other words, they were close enough to get each other. Dora, what's what next? Did, did I do it? If, I, if I'm allowed, I, 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 would, I will ask the next question, which is very short. And um, mm -hmm. um, um, actually, I have two more questions. The, the next question is what? what, what That's um, why they called on you, you know, because they knew you would. Yes, I, <laughs> I know him very well. And... <laughs> Thank you. Uh, what differentiates uh, Christians, Jews, and Samaritans are one of the most important things is the biblical canon. Uh, so we have Christian and Jews having a big canon, including prophets and prophetic tradition, which I will put it on a very important place. Samaritans not having the prophetic tradition. How would you comment this uh, 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 different difference, which I will, um, which I would evaluate as a very important one? Uh, remember that for Christians, prophets and psalms become most important. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I agree. For Jews and for Samaritans, the Pentateuch is most important. Yes. And so on the one hand, Jews and Christians have Malachi, right? But they're mm -hmm. reading it in such different ways, except for occasional readers like Origen, like Jerome, like some of their, um, the Renaissance folk, right? Uh, except for that exclusion, they're reading it in such different ways that you wouldn't know Isaiah is the same Isaiah. Right? To the point that when I was a kid and these Christian missionaries would show up at our door and they'd start quoting biblical verses, I look at them and say, it says that. And so they're really doing very different things with the same books. Jews and Samaritans, on the other hand, are looking at it and saying, okay, how do I keep the Sabbath? What does the Passover sacrifice look like? Right? What's the song at the sea? And, and their intensity ends at you know, the death of Moses and begins at creation. And while Jews may have the rest of the books and they're on the books and all of that, they weren't studied in the same way uh, with the intensity, right? The, um, when I was a kid, it went, I can tell you, I went from the Torah to the Mishnah to the Talmud. And on the side, we did some Bible, right? Which would be very different from the education of a Christian kid who would read New Testament and then Old Testament on the side. And, right, and, and but not only the Old Testament stuff that doesn't deal with blood and guts. And, and the right? prophet was not, the not, book of Daniel. The, right, the, the end of Exodus, it wasn't so interesting. Yeah. Or Leviticus. And so how we read, even even when we have the same books, is, 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 a, is a complex wonder. Uh, my, my, the, the, the question stays, uh, what led to that uh, so important difference between Samaritans and Jews, namely the acceptance and not acceptance or not acceptance of the prophetic tradition, uh, uh, which is a very, uh, for me, it, it's amazing since you, 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 you mentioned a couple of times the difference between the two Pentateuchs. I would say, uh, although the differences, the Pentateuchs are pretty similar, uh, uh, the Pentateuchs of the both communities. Uh, uh, so, so, and I, I dealt, they're not. I, I, I dealt also with, with some places in, in which I strongly believe the Samaritan Pentateuch has an older reading uh, than the Jewish one. Um, yes, Stefan Shore says that too. Mm -hmm. right? uh, uh, in, in his commentaries and his work. Um, so there are, that, that's, been, that's a long conversation that goes back, as you know, to the early months, to Scalinger and those guys. I mean, I, this, is, this is an old debate about what to do about certain verses. Um, uh, having, having said that, um, you know, um, as, as Simon and Garfunkel said, till a man hears what he wants to hear and disregards the rest, um, each community has its book and, and, and does it differently. And, and can hate each other for doing it that way. That the Samaritans don't have uh, a Judean prophet is not surprising. For, for me, it's a bit surprising because uh, I, I, if I move into the biblical world, I, I perceive the prophetic uh, tradition as coming heavily from the, the north. So mm -hmm. the oldest prophet is still a Samaritan. Is he's right. not a Samaritan? He's, he's a Jew having moved to Samaria. But but uh, um, again, um, these terms don't make any difference. Then right. Mm -hmm. Uh, These but, but, terms didn't make any difference. Of course, of course. And, and, all, and, remember, they're all Israelites, and that's the key. 
right? Yeah, yeah of course, of course, of course. But uh, uh, still, I'm very surprised by the rejection uh, by the Samaritans of the prophetic tradition, which is heavily, uh, uh, I mean, the prophetic tradition is heavily bound with the North, with the Yahwistic uh, uh, tradition coming from the north, and and uh, 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 I would say, and 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 I I I, I tend to perceive Isaiah and uh, and then also Jeremiah and Ezekiel as uh, pupils of the north prophets, um, uh, as Amos and Osea and uh, and and so on, and and I, I, it, it stays for me a riddle uh, why uh, the prophetic tradition was rejected in the north uh, version of biblical tradition um, um i might even go further if i were samaritan i would use that as a proof for why i'm older uh, that's a very interesting point thank you uh, <laughs> <laughs> right it's fun to put our heads in their head because it gets us out of our own Yes, ideologically, because the Torah is uh, for the prophets, but we know that historically the prophets are pretty much at the beginning of the Torah tradition. I, I would... all, all of our Wellhausen stuff makes no difference to these people. Just, just like, um, just like um, you know, that the, the, uh, that the sc scroll of Abisha is a medieval scroll. Yeah. No, it's not. It goes back to Abisha, right? The, the priest mm -hmm. as far as they're concerned yes it's everything um the fact that I, for our film they were willing to take it out of their its case that's the um the um synagogue leader Najah, who you saw before um said to us on film i have never touched this and i have been the synagogue leader for 18 years he had to get special permission from the high priest to take it out of its case so that we could film it. And here I am sitting in New York talking to our filmmaker, go get the Abisha scroll. They're not gonna give it to me. Go ask again for the Abisha scroll. They're not gonna give it to me. And then I get a text, they took it out. And he started filming the whole thing for me. You know, it, it's, a, it's a big deal that they took it out. They don't take it out for anybody. They took it out last time for Chaim Herzog, you know? The president, that's the last time they took it out, as far as I can tell. It's a big deal. Uh, why? Because it comes from, it, it comes, Moses could have seen it. Or not really. Um, Aaron could know. Aaron couldn't either. Joshua could have seen it, as far as they're concerned, right? Thank you very much for, 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 for your, 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 your um, uh, answers, uh, Stephen. Um, Thank you, Doran. Um, uh, I let the stage for the uh, for uh, other questions, and if there will be a bit of time, I will ask a last question a bit later. And if not, send me an email, please. Yes, uh, very, very gladly. And Thank everyone else, much. please, uh, stephen.fine at yu.edu. <laughs> okay, so anybody who doesn't want to write, you know how to find me. Please. <laughs> Thank you very much, Doro, for these important questions. But we'll give you some more space at the end of the, the uh, Q&A session, yeah? Let's give the other the opportunity to ask about uh, Samaritans and Jews in late antique Palestine. If there are some other questions. If not, I will... I would like to ask a little bit about the concept of holiness in Samaritan tradition and uh, more specifically about the most important place uh, in Samaritan traditions, the Mount of Garizim, yeah? Because this was also uh, taken into uh, the Christian rhetoric about the pilgrimage in late antiquity and and also uh, in John I, yes it starts in John with yes. the woman at the well yes with with the text from John uh, 420 for example yeah um, I myself I I'm working on Syriac texts and mm -hmm. I uh, dealt with different uh, rhetorical texts on pilgrimage and this Ooh. argument is is very very uh, typical in uh, Christian uh, argumentations against the pilgrimage, against the Syriac pilgrimage to Jerusalem. Uh, 
the Christian authors argues, argued that it is very important to stay in your own place, in your uh, region, and uh, uh, practice the, the uh, virtues as monk, as Christian, and work for your own, uh, uh, for your own church, and not uh, to go to Jerusalem because God works everyone and not only everywhere and not only in uh, in Jerusalem or on this holy mount what is your uh, is your findings on this uh, christian rhetorics using this uh, uh, topos you know the topos is is generalized to 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 most land based and uh, and behavior-based sorts of things in, in, in Jewish tradition, right? You can almost put it next to Cornelius um, with the lot with the food laws. There, there's a consistent step-by-step de-Judaizing process in, in some in some aspects of, of ancient Christianity. Some things are kept, but some things are death definite. The scroll form, for example, right? Jews and Samaritans keep the scrolls form. Christians get rid of it as fast as they can. And so the, the attempt to, de, to take away the geographical, um, you get it early. It's not until Constantine that they begin to reassert it, right? Um, Origen doesn't do it even though he lives there. Um, and so we're dealing with a uh, developing process, I think of, as we all know, of imperial Christianity and the construction of a, uh, a Christian Holy Land, right? That thing that we see in the Madaba map. And that um, locals in Syria, I didn't know this, would um, would say, wait a minute, um, what do you need to go there for? You can go to church here, right? Our church yeah. is the Holy of Holies. What do we need that for, right? Or, or in Rome, they could do the same thing. They could create a Holy of Holies, right? Where the Pope has the, the menorah and the Ark of the Covenant in the basement. Um, is uh, typical. I mean, in Western Christianity, which I do know a little better, um, the, tra the transformation of the uh, Church of the Holy Sepulchre, whether to, to Dijon or whether to Autun or wherever, right? The form of it, or Saint St St Santa Stefano Rotondo in Rome, to the mother of all of that, um, is, is not just about um, be looking like the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. It's about being the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Um, Christianity doesn't need the geography in the same way, except that it develops it. So I can see why that would be a balance. Jews never had that problem mm -hmm. because they never had this discussion about the synagogue being as, 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 as good as the temple, right? I, I wrote a book um, on, on the history of the synagogue holiness and, and, and there what I said was, and it was, and it was revolutionary in a way that I didn't understand why, that the synagogue was the holy place of the time that isn't holy. In other words, after the destruction of the temple and before the rebuilding of the temple, it's rebuilding in messianic times, you can have this bubble of time that has no relevance. And in it, you pull in temple imagery to make it relevant. Right, and so a synagogue becomes a holy place, and I could show how it happened year by year, almost for a thousand years. Right, and I have the text to do it, just as I just did with the Jewish Samaritan relationship. Um, but it wasn't obvious that it would happen that way, and no one would ever say that the temple, the synagogue, was a replacement for the temple, which is what you find in all those old-time Christian handbooks. Right, the synagogue is a replacement for the temple. Guess what? In Christianity, it's a replacement for the temple. The church is a replacement for the temple. In Judaism, there ain't no replacement for the temple. There's waiting for the temple and using its metaphors until then. Okay, so at least for Jews, and I think for Samaritans as well, they want the tabernacle back. They want it to come out of the cave, which is of course described also in, in, in Second Maccabees. They want it out of the cave second or first i forget and they want it um reset up on the mountain and they want the tahab to return and they want at ratzon the, the period of goodness to return and they want this awful period that we're living in between 
the redemptive moment and the second redemptive moment to end. Sound familiar? All right, so, so they're living the same business and they want their temple too. Now, Christians don't have the temple coming out of the heavens and landing in Jerusalem at the time of the revelation, at the apocalypse, even if they do go to visit Jerusalem. Anyway, that's okay, all I would do. You. Thank you very much. Doro, you have a remark yeah. or a question? Very, very important topic, I would say. And uh, I ask for for uh, permission to say a couple of words to that. That's beautiful, Stephen. In in, in the in the in the um, uh, apocalypse of John is even written, and there is no temple in that city because the Lord right. your God will be that temple. So I That's would right. say it, it's about two very different. Uh, uh, a conception of holiness. One is a religious, in my perception, and one is a mystical perception of holiness, which means one, uh, uh, one concept of holiness, the mystical one is a participatory one, so, um, and um, uh, in, in which each person is called to participate, to take place, uh, and the other one is, I would say, is a, it, but I, I, it's a bit complicated to uh, to, to, to find the, the 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 fitting words. The other one is a is a differentiating uh, 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 concept of holiness. So holiness is uh, not to speak about the fact that uh, kodesh, uh, the, the 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 oldest meaning of the word, it seems to be to set apart. To put apart, yeah. You have it also in the in the leakdishi sha to put aside uh, a woman uh, um, um, to I, sanctify. I would, to, uh, to sanctify, but I wouldn't. You know, the Christians are speaking very much about the uh, this word uh, denoting the marriage in Jewish uh, 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 in Jewish tradition. Uh, also pointing out on the side, but, but I, I don't und I understand the, the, the concept of marriage as a sanctification, as a separation of the woman from the, um, for, from, for, from the other women, uh, only for the yeah, one man. Yeah, but not for rabbis, but not for rabbis. Yeah, but, but you know, uh, if, you, if you take the marriage and then the divorce, you have the formula at the marriage, you are sanctified, and then you have the, the, the formula on the divorce, you are uh, accessible now. Now you are accessible to each man, uh, which is the very opposite of the marriage, which is not right. accessible Absolutely. to anybody. Absolutely. 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 So, so that, that's let, why let I me go say... back to this stuff. Yeah, but, but... Um, you know, when I was a graduate student, I studied at the Monastery of the Cross in Jerusalem, so, so I could understand you. Um, because I studied carefully East, Eastern liturgical theology with these very careful distinctions in terminology, trying to figure out what rabbis meant when they called something holy. Mm -hmm. Because in, in, in Jewish usage, it's so utterly slippery because it's not a theologically constructed system that way, right? That I could do spiritual versus holy, wouldn't make sense in that system. Uh, what am I supposed to call it? This pure and this holy. And how do you define purity? Oh, as holiness. And how do you define holiness? As purity. <laughs> it, 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 in other words, it's, it's a series of, of, of terms and value concepts that float around together, which only work, I think, for me at least, in, in, in a real human community. In other words, you can talk about holiness in English, holiness and holiness and um, sacrality, right? Which Rudolf Otto will go to Mars with those two things, right? Um, but the reality is watching someone be both holy and sacred and separate and pure and all those things at the same moment isn't defined with, within Jewish text with the precision that you find it, especially in, 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 in the Orthodox liturgical theology tradition, but, but with, with other kinds of, of uh, both Catholics as well, right? Not Protestants, they're a different game altogether. Um, and and I, I really think that once we get past the language and get into the pews, what, what they do in the Eastern church and what they do in synagogues ain't that different. Um, and the clerics can try to define these things 
But if you ask the people sitting in the pews, well, is that holy or is that separate or is that spiritual? They look at you like, thank God. <laughs> <laughs> Dealing with biblical text uh, uh, concerning the holiness, I have the following impression. And I will tell you, I, I will tell it in, in a couple of seconds. And I will ask you, Stephen, what do you say about that? And also, of course, also the other participants, uh, when looking at the Pentateuch, also, the, the biblical, the, the, the biblical critical tradition in, in science uh, um, uh, stresses that differentiation, namely between priestly text and the so-called holiness code. You know, the holiness code, uh, it, it's a, a kind of a bit separate tradition in the realm of the priestly texts. Right. And I would say, I, I have the impression the, the concept of holiness in the rabbinic uh, texts or, or in rabbinic perception goes back to the priestly text, while the, in, in the Christian uh, uh, perception of the holiness, it goes a bit more to the so-called holiness code, where the holiness is to be um, offered as well to the people, where the people is to take part into the holiness of God, of course, through a very complicated mechanism. But in the holiness, uh, I have the impression in the holiness code, holiness is to be uh, uh, prolonged or to, to, to be extended, uh, while in the priestly codes, holiness is to be uh, kept away from the people. Um, well, Nachmanides, right, in the 13th century, yeah. innovated. He created a category, a, a separate commandment of holiness. Mm -hmm. Okay, and, you know, you have 613, you can do it a lot of different ways. You know what people do with the 10. So you can imagine what they can do at 613. <laughs> so, um, Amos Funkenstein, who was a, a great uh, historian of Judaism and, and, and one of my teachers, um, wrote about Nachmanides and, his, and where he got certain ideas. And his theory is that um, Nachmanides gained a lot from that conversation with Pablo Cristiani. Mm -hmm. He learned about typology, for example, and began to use it, right? And so you'll find Hanukkah in the beginning of, of numbers in his commentary, right? Well, if you're talking about the menorah, let's throw in Hanukkah, right? So it's not as heavy typology as you find in Christian sources, but he picked up on typology. Another thing he picked up on is holiness as a separate category. Just as you're saying. In other words, he says that, a, as Nachmanides says, um, a person can be the most repulsive, disgusting thing in the world and still keep all of the commandments. Hence, there is a commandment to be holy that is an is a overarching commandment to the system. Now, that exists in antiquity, but as is often the case with Jewish text, it's not categorized until the Middle Ages, and Nachmanides is the one who categorized it. And so it's not evident until he, he says it, right? And as soon as he says it, you say, oh yeah, of course. And that's what they did, right? So I'm not sure that if, if you deal with it in terms of biblical source criticism, yeah, you're right. You know, Judaism tends to be more, right? And Christianity does the more spiritual. But if you don't, if you go through the rabbis and watch how they play this ter mm -hmm. terminological glob of material that they feel no need to organize because they figure that, well, if you're doing the right thing, you're going to think the right thing. It takes Nachmanides to actually say, well, really? You sure? <laughs> <laughs> And, yeah. and, 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 you know, if you'd said that to Rabbi Akiva, he would have said, well, well what, you think we're going to let somebody evil around here? You know, it existed. They just, it happens with a lot of things that I deal with that um, people say it didn't exist in antiquity. And then I see it in the medieval. And then I can see why the people in the medieval saw it in antiquity and realize, yeah, they just didn't have language for it. Um, Paulo, uh, Carlo Ginsburg deals a lot with that notion of unarticulated concepts that, just find their language later. Cool. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, 
This was a lovely discussion. Um, I would like to come a little bit back to some visual uh, motives, visual pictures, and namely to this element, uh, bread and wine, as part of this uh, difference between uh, the social context of Jewish, respectively Samaritan people. Uh, in which way are those two pictures part of a holiness code or holiness process? Um, because you present- Again, everything in Judaism and everything in Samaritanism is, is about being holy. Um, wine is sacramental, as you know, right? Uh, um, pagan, pagans dedicated, poured, it, poured little bits to the, to the divinities. Christians used it as a sacramental wine, mm -hmm. right? Um, it used to be that uh, the best wine in America came from uh, monasteries. And in some places it still does, um, I hear. Now, the idea of kosher wine uh, was, was one of those separation things. Italian Jews um, didn't consider their neighbors to be quite as idolatrous as others might have mm -hmm. and, and dropped it for a while, right? It's back again because of larger Jewish cultural dynamics. But mm -hmm. in Italy, they drank the same wine as everybody else, but it was that was the unusual case. Um, mm -hmm. Jewish wine generally came from Jewish wine merchants, mm -hmm. right? Uh, yes. Why? Because they didn't want it dedicated to another religious cult. So, and so when rabbis who are going to all this effort to make sure that Jews use Jewish wine can claim that Samaritans are not following, are not using their own wine and not even using Jewish wine, but are using the pagan wine. Wow, that's a big deal, which may feel like nothing to somebody outside of this, right? But that's the whole point. It's the little things, right? Those mm -hmm. little nuances that make these groups distinct. I, I'm, I'm sure, uh, well, where I live, um, you can tell different kinds of Jews sometimes by how they wear their hat. When I made, when we made our documentary, I chose which cap to wear very carefully because I was going to be sending <laughs> signals to the Israelis <laughs> by what I wore. <laughs> Okay, Doro, please. I, I, would, I would like to say very shortly something to that uh, by chat or no, uh, how to say, I, um, uh, I forgot the word in English. Um, um, I, uh, I wrote my PhD um, on, on wine, bread and, and oil in, in Judaism, in the Bible and so on. <laughs> oh, really? Uh, Can I see yes. it? Uh, it, uh, it's in German and, and it's not yet published, but in, in a couple of months will be. Um, cool. So I, I called uh, my dissertation the holy bread of rabbinic Judaism, and I, I dealt a lot with challah, with hafashat challah, and uh, with the origin and with the uh, with, um, history of the ritual. I would say the, the ritual of first links of bread, wine, and oil are the oldest characteristic of the Yahvistic uh, cult. So Exodus, right. 34, Exodus 34 and Exodus uh, um, uh, 19 until 22, 23. Um, uh, so uh, there is very, um, very sharp and very, um, uh, how to put it, to put it, extremely uh, uh, um, underlined that um, um, you have to bring the first link of these three uh, food elements uh, as, a, as a, I would say, even as a confession of faith. Um, uh, to, to the uniqueness and unseen barkite of, of the Jewish God or Jewish God, that's right. the, the biblical God. So I would say that's why these elements are even at stake um, because they, yes. are, uh, they, they are very deep and very old symbols of the, of the biblical cult and biblical God and his uniqueness uh, respectively, uh, his uh, uh, basic characteristics. So I, I would say... Sorry, I would say to Katarina, that's, uh, th that's why uh, wine and bread and it, it's always uh, uh, at stake. It's important because it's the 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 the, the, the uh, visual symbol of the uh, so-called uh, 
um, uh, or um, genuine uh, Yahwistic cult. So that together with yeah. the first fruits. Of course, of course, with the Bikurim, together with the first and, fruits. That's the course, that's the fourth one. Yes, and if we if we look at the the Deuteronomy twenty six, yeah, Arami Aved Avi, and and he go to went to Misraim and come back, and now Hineni, I I I've come with the first fruits, with, with with the bread, with the wine, with the oil, and with the Bikurim to show my gratitude to you, God, that you gave me this land. So it's uh, it's. Uh, uh, central to the to the cult of the biblical God, uh, uh, first fruits and reshita uh, lechem, reshita o tirosh veitzhar. This uh, um, um, I, by chance I came to that because my topic was actually hafrashat uh, hala. Uh, so the the. Oh, it got more interesting with time. <laughs> Sorry. It got more interesting with time. I'm looking forward. <laughs> 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 okay, so we did thank it. you. Uh, if you want to comment something more, or if not, I would like no, to... Let me just say before yeah. we end what a delight this has been to be with you. And, and I hope you'll all come see my exhibition and certainly see the, see the movie when it comes out. Um, the Samaritan thing is, is so utterly interesting because it provides a tool for us um, who study this part of the world and its religions that people just didn't think about. It, it's been forgot, it was forgotten from the 1930s and 40s until the 70s and really didn't find mainstreaming until just now. Uh, and, and I oddly found myself in the middle of that process and, and it's thrilling. So if you haven't studied this before folks, uh, it's really neat. There's gonna be a special issue of one of the German um, biblical archaeology magazines coming up on Samaritans. So for people who are more comfortable in German, that's coming. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Very much. Thank you. Uh, a last point maybe of discussion. I would like to um, uh, rise. Is the this uh, uh, picture of resurrection of the dead. Uh, and this was a point of uh, uh, a point to differentiate between Kushai and, and, and the Jews. And uh, what is your opinion? Uh, why was this taken into, into debate, the restoration uh, of the bodies? Um, this, Samar not, Samaritans, uh, as far as rabbis are concerned, ancient Samaritans didn't believe in the resurrection of the dead, which is where Daru and the um, Sadducees come from, right? Um, they don't believe in resurrection of the dead. And so by the time you get to the Islamic period, they do. Okay. Now, either there's two possibilities. Rabbis didn't notice or their theology developed. Those are the two options, right? Um, I don't know which, but I can tell you that living under Islam um, had, had, lots of, had lots of importance for them in, 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 in their development. Um, for example, wine, just to go back for a second. They never think much about wine for the very simple reason that where they come from, they were the ones who made it. Because the Muslims certainly didn't, right? And there weren't any Jews to speak of. And so um, there are issues that coming out of a, a thousand years of Islam were important to were not important because they didn't have to think about them, right? My guess is that once they ran into uh, Christians bothering them all the time about resurrection of the dead and Muslims dealing with the end time and Jews on the side, it was sort of hard not to have an answer. And whether it was articulated early or not, this is going back to before, right? Whether they had it and just didn't bother talking about it or whether they had it and did talk about it, but we don't know it or what we don't know. I, I tend not to like to say things didn't exist before I can read them because it's just not true. Um, but then I'm going on really um, thin ice in, in making such claims. And so at the point at which this question comes up, I usually say, these are the possibilities. And now let's go on to another subject. 
Okay. 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 Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, any other questions or remarks? Yes, everyone, please stay safe. Okay. I get my second <laughs> shot tomorrow. This is, this is the most safe, important time. Stay healthy and, and, and you know, um, we'll do this in person someday. Yeah, definitely. Thank you so much for your uh, impressive presentation. And uh, thank you once again that you accepted our invitation. And we hope that we meet in person in Bucharest and at the Institute for Advanced Studies in Advanced Culture and Civilization. As the Samaritans would say, inshallah. <laughs>